Today, I want to talk about one of the most influential and divisive television writers of the past decade. I'm talking about Stephen Moffat, the co-creator of BBC Sherlock and the showrunner of Doctor Who since 2010. Depending on who you ask, he's either the greatest thing to happen to the United Kingdom in the 21st century or a blight on the television industry with very little middle ground. With Sherlock seemingly over and Moffat leaving Doctor Who this year, it's time to reflect on his contributions to television. Spoilers ahead for Doctor Who through Series 9 and Sherlock through Series 4. Today on TV Junkie, The Trial of Stephen Moffat. This trial will be conducted British style, with a discussion of Moffat's upsides, his downsides, and his most controversial aspects. I'm pretty sure that's how it works in New Crumpeton, I didn't care to look it up. Oh, and the wig, I'm wearing the wig, very important. Let's start off with Moffat's upsides, and first of all, he's very good at writing larger-than-life characters, it's a cornerstone of both Sherlock and Doctor Who. You also can't really fault his dialogue, whether it's upbeat banter or long-winded dramatic speeches, Stephen Moffat knows how to handle the dialogue portion of a script. And while he has some issues when it comes to season-long arcs, he is very good at constructing a single hour of television. A Study in Pink, the premiere of Sherlock, ingeniously updated Victorian characters and storylines in a contemporary setting. A Scandal in Belgravia, the Series 2 premiere of Sherlock, was a well-balanced mix of comedy and romance set against an espionage plot that highlighted Sherlock Holmes' strengths and weaknesses as a character. Heaven Sent, the penultimate episode of Doctor Who Series 9, was 60 minutes with just a single character, the Twelfth Doctor, imprisoned in a castle in the middle of the ocean looking to escape with a final act twist that recontextualized the prior 50 minutes in heartbreaking fashion. By contrast, in the episode Blink, the Doctor barely appears, only doing so in a series of DVD easter eggs where he communicates a message to someone he's never met in order to save the day. This episode also introduced one of the most terrifying creatures in modern television, and with that we will segue to Moffat's ability to come up with intriguing monsters and concepts in science fiction. The Weeping Angels, time-traveling statues that can move when no one is looking. The Vatasha Narada, shadows that eat flesh. A literal crack in time and space that can erase people from history. You'll be hard-pressed to find a Doctor Who fan that doesn't agree that Moffat knows how to prey on basic human fear. Moffat's also been known to push the boundaries of what's acceptable for British television. Look no further than A Scandal in Belgravia, which featured the character of Irene Adler entirely naked, a scene that would not have worked without some expert camera work. The Doctor Who two-parter Dark Water and Death in Heaven explored the concepts of death and the afterlife, including a quite literal interpretation of heaven. The concept that the dead could still feel their bodies being cremated on Earth disturbed viewers, many of whom complained directly to the BBC. Even if you think Moffat went too far with these episodes, you have to respect that he's willing to take these risks. Finally, Moffat succeeds when it comes to setting up long-term story arcs. It's the conclusions where he falters. Doctor Who Series 6 started off in the most unpredictable fashion. The Doctor dies, he is murdered on the beach by an impossible astronaut that just walks out of the water. Across the world, people were eager to see how the Doctor would undo his own death. The season premiere did a very good job at making the audience believe this actually was the Doctor and that he actually did die. The Series 3 finale of Sherlock ended by reintroducing James Moriarty, who killed himself in the Series 2 finale, via pre-recorded video. Here the intrigue wasn't, how is this man still alive, because conventional wisdom was Moriarty was dead, we saw him shoot himself, even Moffat at the time was saying, this guy is dead. The curiosity here came from wondering, what did Moriarty plan in case of his death? An intriguing concept, one that kept fans thinking for three years. So how do these story arcs turn south? Well, let's figure it out as we turn to the downsides of Stephen Moffat, and we will start with his inability to end season-long arcs. So, how did the Doctor get out of his own death? Well, he really was there on the beach, miniaturized inside of a robot version of himself, on loan from the time cops that he ran into in Nazi Germany. I was very ticked off after waiting half a year for that answer. As for Moriarty's return, well of course he remained dead, but rather than him having any large plan from beyond the grave, 
The anticipation of his plan was only a smokescreen to distract the audience from the impending reveal of Euros. Oh, Euros. <coughs> I'll throw in another example. Silence will fall. Those three words were a creepy message delivered by an unidentifiable voice in the Series 5 finale of Doctor Who. A very intriguing message. What's the result? Well, a religion called the Silence, featuring an alien race called the Silence, S-I-L-E-N-T-S, who wanted to prevent the end or the silence of the universe. Complicated enough for you? Moving on, Stephen Moffat struggles when it comes to long-term character arcs, how characters develop over a long period of time. Everything is in service of the larger plot, and that includes a character's motivations. This means characters can be wildly inconsistent in how they are written to fit whatever Moffat wants to do with the larger story. Instead of characters progressing naturally, Moffat relies on hidden pasts and secrets to create drama between characters. Finally, Moffat has an arrogance about him. He acts and he writes as if he is smarter than his audience, and it comes off as smug. He also loves to mess with continuity wherever possible and recreate it in his own image. Look no further than the name of the Doctor, which featured companion at the time Clara Oswald being dispersed throughout the Doctor's entire past. Also, I'd like to note that when Moffat inherited the Doctor, the Doctor was like 900-something years old. Now he's well over 2,000 years old. The character was artificially aged just because. It might be a minor adjustment, but Moffat has plenty of these minor adjustments that all add up and just infuriate some fans. Moffat also reuses a lot of the same narrative tricks. Maybe the one I've seen pop up the most is the Doctor meets a side character when that character is a child and then immediately pops up in that same side character's life about 20 years later when they're now an adult. The first time, it's entertaining. The second time, it's less entertaining but still enjoyable. By the fourth time, I'm over it. So those are Moffat's downsides, and now I'm going to dig into probably his most controversial aspect as a writer, and that is how he treats and writes his female characters. I'm going to describe a typical Stephen Moffat female, and I want you to guess who it is. She's strong-willed, but has a mysterious past, capable of taking care of herself, but unable to exist independently of the show's protagonist. Did you guess everyone? If so, you're correct! Come on down, you've won a Brexit. Clara Oswald, Mary Watson, River Song, Euros, Missy, and many more female characters who only exist to be a puzzle for the protagonist to solve. Sure, these women all kick ass, but it doesn't fix the fact they are not characters, they're plot devices. And this is Moffat's greatest shortcoming. I wouldn't go as far to say that he's a sexist or misogynist like some of his detractors would like to say, but it is an issue that needs to be fixed. I've heard good things about the new Doctor Who companion, Bill, and I'm hoping she's the solution to Moffat's female protagonist woes. In conclusion, Moffat excels when it comes to witty banter, sci-fi concepts, and standalone episodes of television, but he's unable or unwilling to develop characters independent of the plot he wants to tell, he can't end a long-term story arc, and he can be self-indulgent. Hopefully, moving on to a new project, one that's not an adaptation of a previous work, will refresh him creatively, and I look forward to seeing what he does next. Thanks for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it. Please, let's have a conversation in the comments below. What do you think about one Mr. Stephen Moffat? Subscribe to my channel if you have not done so already, and stay tuned for more, including vlogs of the new Doctor Who series here on TV Junkie.